We've got a great panel this morning that's going to talk a little bit about Mississippi politics. These are guys who are out covering politics day in and day out, and they keep us informed of what's going on. I'm going to just introduce them from coming down the row here at the, at the far end is Paul Gallo, host of the Morning Gallo Show on Super Talk Mississippi. Next to him is Ronnie Agnew, the executive editor of the Claren Ledger. Sheila Bird is a uh, capital reporter with the Associated Press. Jeff Pinder is the uh, political columnist reporter for the Sun Herald. And then Bobby Harrison is the capital bureau chief and columnist for the Northeast Mississippi Daily Journal. The guy that's going to keep all these folks in line today is Sid Salter. Sid's the prospective editor of the Claren Ledger. He also is the host of On Deadline with Sid Salter in the afternoons on Super Talk Mississippi. Sid, take it away. Thank you, Scott. All right, ladies and gentlemen, let's get right to it. The Mississippi Legislature faces a fiscal year 2012 budget gap that could be as much as $600 million with no federal stimulus funds or other large pool of one-time money available to fill it. In that environment, what do you see on the horizon for public education funding generally in Mississippi and specifically for the so-called mid-level funding that's being requested by the state's community colleges. We'll, uh, we'll start with Bobby Harrison. Is this on now? Uh, well, the, uh, the, some of the, the, the Democratic House leadership has talked about perhaps some uh, uh, tax increases and some assessments to offset some of that loss of money. Uh, quite for, and uh, the chairman of the, Johnny Stringer, the chairman of the House Appropriations Committee has even talked about uh, a so-called sin tax, which would probably be on casinos, liquor, and some of those type things, where it would only go into effect contingent upon a, uh, uh, a, a approval by the voters during a, a, a referendum. Uh, quite frankly, I don't know how far any of those, uh, uh, I don't, I mean, the leadership, I don't think they're actually very optimistic of getting that through the legislature themselves. And if that doesn't happen, uh, you're going to have uh, cuts. I mean, the cuts during the past three years have been pretty uh, pretty substantial. There's uh, there's 700 less teachers in the schools throughout the state this year than there were last year. There's uh, hundreds of p people positions been eliminated at the IHL and the community colleges. And I think that uh, without some type of additional revenue, you're going to see more of that, more and more teacher positions uh, uh, and other positions in the school districts eliminated. And uh, but one thing to remember is there. Uh, uh, this is an election. This will be an election year, and there's uh, probably about 600 million dollars in reserve funds, whether it's a rainy day fund. Uh, there is some. Uh, Stimulus money left over that uh, the second round of stimulus that was passed in this summer they they have about 127 million dollars there so they do have some uh, reserves to offset some of that loss of money. Jeff Pender, 600 million dollar budget gap. Uh, what do you see the legislature doing? More budget cuts or new revenues? More budget cuts, definitely. Uh, as Bobby mentioned, with the election time rolling around, uh, I don't think anyone. Uh, I don't think any plan for even even sin taxes would uh, would fly right now, given the political climate. Sheila Bird, budget cuts would reach a cumulative 23 to 25 percent if they continue this year. Uh, will the legislature choose new revenues or make additional budget cuts? I would have to agree with my colleagues on budget cuts. Um, again, it's an election year, and I don't see any of the um, candidates who will be running getting out there campaigning on raising taxes of any sort. There will be a little bit of stimulus money left over because some of the school districts have um, put some away, squirreled it away for next fiscal year at the request of Governor Barber. But other than that, there will be some budget cuts. And that's unfortunate, especially for the Department of Mental Health, because Ed LeGrand is already warn lawmakers that there's a possibility that some of the mentally ill will find, wind up in jails instead of mental institutions because they can't pay for it. Ronnie Agnew, what's your take on a $600 million budget gap? Well, I, I just think that at this point in the legislative uh, agenda that I know it's an election year and I know times are difficult, but I would just say that failure to plan is failure to, pl failure to fail. You're going to fail if you don't have a plan. 
We know it's coming. The perfect storm is coming. We know that the federal stimulus money has worked its way through the system by and large. So there needs to be some kind of systemic planning to get ready for that rainy day, that tough time. Uh, everybody that we've come in contact with has always said that, you know, they need more, more, more. The community colleges with 90,000 students are educating more students in Mississippi than anybody. And they're, they're bursting at the seams, if pardon the cliche. Our university system, they're hurting. So, you know, right now we can sit there and we can sit back and we can wait for the crisis or we can develop strategies to avert the crisis in some way. Uh, I think we got some hard decisions to make as a legislative team. And uh, I think it would be less than d being a great public servants, servant if we choose to ignore those challenges. We know they're there. We have to deal with them and not when the crisis is right in front of us. Paul Gallo, second year in a row, state agencies have gone into the budget hearing process asking for, in addition to a billion dollars of additional funding from a legislature that's dealing with a $600 million budget gap. What do you see on the horizon next year? More budget cuts, new revenue. Um, I think Bobby Moak probably beat me back over here. Bobby was my last guest this morning, Chairman Moak, and I asked him, about the syntaxes, and I think Bobby specifically said as far as syntaxes, he would not let that out of committee, uh, meaning the casino, the uh, liquor, uh, and he said he wouldn't let it out of committee. I asked him if the speaker asked him to, and he said he would not let it out of committee. So according to the chairman of gaming, uh, that's off the table. I, I have no idea what's on the Christmas tree that Billy McCoy said. Billy McCoy issued, talking to the Clarion Ledger, said he had a Christmas tree of uh, ideas out there, licenses and fees, probably that, another, another level as far as income tax, higher income earners. But I think the American people, or the Mississippi people, the people who uh, stay in communication with us are asking the universities and colleges and the schools to uh, do what everybody else is doing. I think it's going to be a big fight uh, on several issues, maybe clouded with redistricting too, but uh, it's going to be an interesting year. All right. Next question, we'll start with Jeff Pender. Governor Haley Barber has turned the constitutionally weak position of governor under the 1890 Constitution into a dominant position in state government. How has he done so? And when Governor Barber's tenure is completed, will that paradigm carry over into the next governor's term, or will we return to the old paradigm, a strong House Speaker, a strong Lieutenant Governor, and a less powerful governor? I just had this conversation recently with someone within the last week or two, and uh, I asked them the same question. How did he, how did he do that? I was trying to think back, uh, and uh, they summed it up, I thought, pretty well. He uh, you know, said, give me the rule book. He sat down and looked at it, and he figured out how to use it to his advantage. And uh, obviously, he uh, knew a trick or two. I think he learned in Washington. Uh, as far as, you know, bell cows and votes and, you know, thing, things that have always been uh, been done, done that way. I, I think he will li leave some vestige of that, obviously. I, I think there's going to still be some, uh, some setup. You know, he brought a lot of young people in on his team. I, I think some of them will stay around. Whether it will... I don't think it'll go back exactly like it was, obviously, strong speaker, quite like it was, but I, I don't know if we'll see it, the governor's office, again, as strong as, as he had it. I, I think he's, he's unique. <laughs> uh, and uh, I wonder if, uh, in some shape, form, or fashion, he might still be involved. I guess that depends on where he, uh, where he goes on beyond there, so. All right, Sheila Bird, same question. That's a kind of tough one. I, I agree with Jeff that Barber is unique. You have to remember that he is this great strategist. And one thing about Governor Barber is that he does not, he plans his moves, several moves in advance. He doesn't just act automatically. And it would take another governor to be able to do the same thing and I don't know that we're going to necessarily elect one of those. And we also have to remember that the House 
the state house is a little fractured right now, and one of the reasons is because of Governor Barber, so it just remains to be seen. Ronnie Agnew. Well, I've said it for the record many times. I, I have yet to meet uh, more seasoned and more strategic governor than Haley Barber. Uh, Haley Barber has ruled Mississippi in a way like we have not seen in some time in terms of governors. He basically has set the agenda for the state. He's turned, he's turned the office of governor into one of the most powerful offices in Mississippi when, frankly, it didn't used to have that kind of clout. So, no, Sid, I don't think that we'll see uh, the return of that kind of power. I think what Governor Barber was successful in doing was bring national strategies into Mississippi. And I don't know that we have, and this is no dis disrespect for anyone who is considering running for governor, but there's, there's no disrespect, but I don't know that we have a lot of people who possess those political skills as, as Haley Barber, and I think that's a fair comment. And so, so, no, I think we will see a return to a more traditional way in the, with the House having more power and so forth going forward. Paul Gallup. Um, I haven't seen him behind the scene. Uh, he spent an hour with me on the air this week, or uh, was the last week, and he, uh, he uh, you see him as a media person. A lot of you folks in politics have seen him behind the scenes. A lot of us haven't seen him. I'm sure some people in marketing have seen him as a, as a good uh, Chamber of Commerce guy. Uh, all of those things are wrapped up into one. It really is. Uh, I know talking to him off the air, sometime I can get to him uh, a little bit more about Haley Barber than on the air. One of the things that always amazed me about him is I think he carries a trust factor. Uh, I, I, the story on Toyota back in the, the bleak days after they made the announcement and then people were saying it'll never come and everything back with the Prius story and all of this, it just looked bleak that that, that factory would ever open. And someone told me, no, before he leaves office, that plant will be open because he has that type of trust factor and relationship with it. And I thought that's a, that's a tremendous statement. And then that, of course, as we all know that came to fruition. So I agree with uh, the rest of the folks. He's a unique governor when you have somebody who knows how to play politics, someone who, who knows strategy, someone who knows the credibility of marketing and of this state. It's hard to find somebody on the scene. Again, no disrespect to anybody, but that's, that's a heck of a package. And uh, it's going to be hard to replace him. Sid? 